I'd like to welcome you to the third and final installment of our fall talk series by the Center for Ethics Education. My name is Stephen Schwartzer, and I am the Associate Director for Academic Programs uh, in the Center for Ethics Education at Fordham University. Uh, the Center for Ethics Education, which is directed by Dr. Celia Fisher, was established in 1999 as an interdisciplinary cross-campus unit at Fordham. The Ethics Center embodies Fordham's commitment to intellectual excellence, social justice, and human dignity through the promotion of ethics education, research, and public dialogue. Our programs include an interdisciplinary master's degree program in ethics and society, an advanced graduate certificate program in healthcare ethics, the HIV and Drug Abuse Prevention Research Ethics Training Institute, or REDI, an undergraduate bioethics minor, and an intercollegiate uh, ethics bowl team. In addition to these programs, we also offer public-facing ethics and social justice programming that engages people in conversation about issues of contemporary social import, such as today's conversation about women's rights and resistance in a global context. Uh, so now to introduce the panel and to say a little bit about our procedure for the evening. Uh, so first, I am excited to uh, introduce you to uh, Dr. Uh, Tamara uh, Fakori, uh, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Uh, she teaches in ethics, uh, social and political philosophy, feminism, the history of philosophy, and the philosophy of race. Her research focuses on the ethics of resisting oppression. Dr. Fakori received her BA in philosophy from American University of Beirut and her master's and PhD in philosophy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Then we have uh, Professor Elizabeth Wickery, uh, who is the executive director of the Leitner Center for International Justice at the Fordham uh, University Law School and an adjunct professor of law. Uh, Professor Wickery uh, teaches courses in public international law, carries out fieldwork, research, and writing on legal developments in Asia, and serves as a law lecturer and course director with the Center for International Humanitarian Cooperation at Fordham. She received her BA in history from Smith College, uh, her JD from New York University School of Law, and also studies at the Hopkins Nanjing uh, Center for Chinese and American Studies in Nanjing, China. And then we have Professor Ramya Kudakalu, who is a Telford Taylor Teaching Fellow and Visiting Instructor of Clinical Law at Cardozo Law School and the Chairperson of the International Human Rights Committee at the New York City Bar. Uh, Professor Kudakalu's research um, and advocacy interests are in anti-discrimination frameworks within international human rights law. Her prior experiences also include research and litigation at the Alternative Law Forum, a collective of human rights lawyers in India committed to responding to issues of social and economic injustice. Uh, this work explores gender and civil liberties at large, representing in particular the rights of sex workers and the LGBTIQ community. Uh, Professor Kudakalu received an LLB from Bishop Cotton Women's Christian Law College in Bangalore, India, and an LLM in international law uh, and justice from Fordham University School of Law. So these are our panelists for the evening. Uh, now for the first part of the discussion, we will have our panelists speak about their work on these issues, and then we will kick off a conversation between them. And we do hope that the rest of you in the audience will be part of the conversation. So we're definitely excited to include questions and contributions from the audience. And to do so, we will be using uh, the private chat function. Uh, so please do submit your questions via private chat to me as the moderator, and I will ask questions for the audience. Uh, and we encourage you to send your questions at any point during the conversation. So with no further ado, I will now hand it over to our panel. And we will begin with uh, Dr. Fakori. Great. Thank you so much, Steve, for the introduction. It's really great to be here with you all. Can everyone see the slides? Awesome. All right. So um, when asked to name examples of resistance to oppression, many people offer prominent historical examples of political activism. 
So they'll name the women's suffrage parade um, from 1913 or Gandhi's salt march from 1930 uh, or the, the Montgomery bus boycott or the more recent uh, Black Lives Matter protests. These extraordinary mass protests were highly organized and politically effective. They had clear demands and excellent leadership. They were grounded in deep commitments to advan advancing justice and human equality in society at large. And ultimately, they led to desirable political changes, including the desegregation of public buses, the granting of women's right to vote in America, the liberation of India from British colonialism, and in raising public consciousness right, about anti-Black racism and police brutality. Inspired by such movements, it's sometimes assumed that all resistance to oppression resembles mass political activism, such as these examples. Um, some pe sometimes people assume that in order to resist oppression, one ought to publicly and explicitly condemn a wrong or injustice, one ought to take steps to correct or ameliorate that wrong um, by changing aspects of the public sphere, um, and that one's action must be reasonably effective in getting their political or moral message across to a public audience or in bringing about desirable uh, political change. For instance, um, Adolf Reed argues that there's no resistance to oppression that does not work to shape the official institutions of public authority that govern and channel people's lives. Anything else is play acting, mere posturing, posing as politics. But if you take the example of Margie from Marjan Satrapi's autobiography, Persepolis, it appears to have nothing in common with these paradigmatic cases of resistance. Um, Margie is a young girl growing up in Iran during the Islamic revolution. She does everything she's not supposed to do according to the regime and to tradition. So she smokes cigarettes, she wears jewelry, she skips class, reads philosophy books, um, buys Iron Maiden tapes from the black market and paints punk is not dead on the back of a jacket that she wears over her chador, which is the mandated dress code uh, for women in Iran. So for those who are unfamiliar, such behavior was illegal or socially stigmatized in Iran at this time. Um, Margie defies sexism and tyranny as they take a toll on her day-to-day -day life and relationships, but she's no political activist. She doesn't engage in strategic collective action. She doesn't attempt to mobilize the public in the name of justice or equality. She doesn't communicate her opposition directly to the Iranian government. Um, she never identifies with any political causes. Uh, moreover, her behavior is not very effective in bringing about large scale changes in uh, Iranian law, politics, or culture. In fact, this is not her primary concern. Instead, her aim is to do what she loves and what interests her in spite of, and sometimes even because of, a regime which tells her not to. Similarly, consider a group that I like to call the female bikers of Cairo. This is a group of women that gets together for joy rides through the streets of Cairo on the weekends, in spite of the pervasive stigma against women riding motorcycles in Egypt. They get a lot of pushback for doing this. Their families are distressed by their activity, calling them stubborn and irrational. They often get sexually harassed and their bikes get vandalized. When asked by uh, journalists why they continue to ride motorcycles when it's so risky for them, um, they don't call themselves feminists. They don't say that they're protesting. In fact, their reports don't show any special indication that they think of themselves as oppressed persons um, or that they operate under any theoretical understanding of sexism. Nevertheless, they know that they're violating deeply entrenched norms, and they're well aware of the physical and psychological costs of what they're doing. 
When asked why they ride their motorcycles, even in light of its obvious risks, what they say is, we do this because we love motorcycles and how we feel with our hair flying in the wind on the open road. Um, it's something that uh, makes us happy and that we love. So if you're anything like me, you'll find Margie um, from Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis and the female bikers of Cairo really admirable. And you'll find them admirable precisely because they're resisting their oppression. Their actions exhibit a kind of personal defiance against the effects of injustice on their day-to-day -day lives. But how should we understand actions like Margie's and the female bikers of Cairo? Given the enormous differences between their behavior and the more familiar paradigms of political activism, can we really say that they're resisting their oppression? And if so, what is the value of this kind of resistance? So oppression doesn't merely affect the official institutions of the state. Its effects run deep into the ordinary processes of everyday life. So I think it's possible to resist the local effects of oppression on one's personal life without attempting to produce desirable changes at the level of our public uh, and political institutions. While under non-oppressive conditions, there would be nothing particularly admirable about riding a motorcycle or doing what my Margie does, uh, buying Iron Maiden tapes, reading philosophy books, et cetera. Um, but when such actions are unjustly forbidden and when there are severe social sanctions in place against doing them the nature of such acts changes they become acts of resistance regardless of whether or not they have a discernible social or political impact so what i want to argue is that margie and the bikers are engaged in a genuine and worthwhile form of resistance to their oppression in particular I think they're engaged in a form of resistance that I call quiet resistance. So quiet resistance is a form of resistance to oppression that involves doing something that one enjoys or cares about, but that is banned or forbidden by um, oppressive customs. Quiet resistors are motivated primarily by personal reasons having to do with their special attachments to the forbidden pursuit, as opposed to by impartial reasons having to do with defending or upholding justice or the common good in society writ large. Quiet resistance differs from more paradigmatic forms of resistance, such as public protest, not only in terms of its motivations, um, but also in terms of its appearance. Unlike paradigms of political protest, whose primary aim is often to communicate about injustice with the public and responsible officials, quiet resistance does not involve making public statements. It's not the special, of the, it's not the special concern of the quiet resistor to do so. In fact, quiet resistors might not care whether others know their moral stance or whether others recognize them to be engaged in acts of resistance. They might even try to keep their views under wraps in order to avoid certain consequences. It's in this special sense that I'm calling quiet resistance quiet. Its primary aim is not to communicate explicit moral or political messages to others, but rather to allow agents to engage with what they love in spite of countervailing pressures from oppression. So this characterization of quiet resistance raises an important question. If quiet resistors don't act against oppressive norms primarily for reasons of justice, but rather out of personal attachments to specific people and activities, um, and if they don't explicitly communicate to others that um, they morally condemn the injustices that they're acting against, then in what sense can we say that quiet resistance is a genuine form of resistance to oppression? at all. So I think quiet resistance is genuine resistance because it shares certain characteristic features of resistance more generally. So acts of quiet resistance, first, cha they challenge oppressive norms. Um, so both Margie and the bikers' actions uh, challenge deeply entrenched patriarchal standards uh, for women's behavior in their societies. Um, second, 
quiet resistors act against oppressive norms with an understanding that their pursuits are socially discouraged. They pursue what they love in spite of, and sometimes even because of the fact that it's forbidden. Um, right, so neither Margie nor the biker's actions are performed by accident or out of ignorance, but with an understanding that such behaviors are socially condemned. So they know what they're doing um, and they do it anyway. Finally, quiet resistance satisfies what I call a risk condition on resistance more generally. Um, so oppressive norms are held in place by systems of social enforcement that serve to punish resistance and reward compliance with these norms. Um, according to my risk condition, one resists oppression only if one risks receiving oppression-related backlash, where oppression-related backlash consists of hostility that is caused by um, or enforces the oppressive norm that one is resisting. And I think we see very clearly in both the case of Margie and the female bikers of Cairo, um, that by doing what they do, by violating these oppressive norms. Um, so in many cases, they, so, so when the bikers are harassed, right, this is a form of oppression related backlash. Uh, when Margie's school teachers, right, attempt to discipline her and confiscate her jewelry, again, this is another, um, oppression related backlash that she's receiving for violating oppressive norms. So since these conditions are characteristic of resistance in general, I think um, this gives a strong reason to consider quiet resistance a genuine form of resistance. And this is true despite the fact that quiet resistors are primarily motivated by reasons of love and not reasons of justice. Um, okay, so Earlier I said that quiet resistors are not interested in communicating their condemnation of injustice to the public, um, nor are they deliberately attempting to reduce or eliminate injustice from uh, the public sphere. But if all this is true, then you might wonder what is the value of quiet resistance? So in a paper called Symbolic Protest and Calculated Silence, Thomas Hill argues that, unfortunately, it's often the case that acts of resistance to oppression are unlikely to result in the elimination of the injustice at large or in convincing the oppressors that one has rights. Sometimes, Hill writes, there seems to be no reasonable hope of achieving these ends. The perpetrators of injustice will not be moved. Protest may be inconvenient or risky to oneself. And it's long range range effects on others may be minimal or may include as much harm as help. In spite of all this, resistance may nonetheless have value. Consider one of Hill's examples. Um, a businessman is invited to a dinner party. Upon arrival, he's shocked to find that the conversation on all sides is openly racist. His polite objections are met with cynical laughter and he becomes convinced that there's nothing he can say that will have any good effect on his colleagues. Should he try to tolerate the conversation and eat his dinner in silence or should he leave the dinner in protest? Even though it is bound to have no positive effect on his colleagues, Hill argues that walking out in protest of the racist conversation is still a good thing to do. What makes it good is that enable, it enables the businessman to act on his values and to express where his loyalties lie, even if only to himself. And Hill argues, this is a commendable and self-respecting thing to do. So I think we can extend Hill's position to explain the value of quiet resistance. Um, regardless of its political potential, the political potential of what they're doing, I think the actions of the bikers and Margie from Persepolis have personal value in the sense that they allow their agents to enact and express their values, what they stand for um, and what they care about. When the bikers ride their motorcycles and when Margie rebels by listening to punk and wearing whatever she wants, um, all of which are things that she's not permitted to do, um, they exhibit their loyalty to themselves against a society that's trying to stifle them. 
they exhibit a staunch refusal to be stopped from living lives that represent who they are and what they care about. And under their circumstances, I think this is a positively courageous thing to do, and one that expresses personal integrity, even if it's not ultimately um, going to lead to large scale social change or more traditional forms of uh, political participation. So I think we should understand the value of quiet resistance in terms of the particular contributions that it makes to the lives of the people who engage in it, as opposed to what it communicates to the public or its effectiveness in eliminating injustice at large. I think um, quiet resistance is valuable in large part because it allows individuals to maintain a certain kind of personal integrity consisting in refusing to be stopped from honoring the people and relationships and goals and activities um, that one cares about. And because this allows individuals to maintain meaning in life under oppressive conditions. Um, all right, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and as a reminder to the audience, um, I invite you to uh, submit questions to me as the moderator at any point uh, during the session. Um, but now we will uh, have uh, Professor uh, Wickery uh, speak. Great, thank you so much. And um, thank you, Tamara, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I don't have any slides. I just thought I would talk through some of the work that um, we're doing here at the Leitner Center, which I'll introduce that um, certainly speaks to the theme of resistance, um, uh, you know, some quiet and, and some perhaps more organized is along the lines that you described for some of your early in some of your earlier slides. Um, so just to, to back up, um, as, uh, as Steve mentioned, I am, I'm an adjunct professor at Fordham Law School, but my day job is really to direct our Leitner Center for International Law and Justice, which is um, the public international law center uh, here at Fordham. And I also teach in the undergraduate and under, uh, and graduate programs in the humanitarian action program. Um, and I mention all of those because in each of those roles, I focus a lot of my time and energy thinking about protest, resistance, um, repression, and gender justice. So much of the teaching that I do uh, focuses specifically on accountability for sexual and gender-based violence, um, especially in conflict settings. Um, but also uh, uh, in other contexts as well. Um, and because as a lawyer and because I'm at a law school, I think a lot about accountability. So I think that's where I'll focus my um, thoughts for this evening. Um, and when we think about sort of how, if, you know, if we're talking about uh, resistance, Increasingly over the last number of years, we have to think about how to preserve that space, preserve and protect that space for resistance. Um, and as a lawyer, and because lawyers love talking about the law and, and lawyers, you know, my, the question that I um, am always ask, asking myself and coming back to is, um, you know, what role does both the domestic law, but um, in particular, the international law play with regard to preserving and protecting that space? So at the Leitner Center, we engage our students through um, these focused seminar courses and practical experiences um, and legal clinic projects in partnership with grassroots advocates, lawyers, um, civil society organizations in a range of countries where we work. Um, that includes the United States. Um, th the work that I do mostly uh, focuses in Asia uh, and the um, projects uh, that we've been working on in most recent years are in China, um, uh, Hong Kong, which is a part of China, but a separate legal jurisdiction, uh, Myanmar, Nepal. And since August of this year, we've been actively supporting efforts um, during the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Um, so I thought I would just kind of get a, give a couple of snapshots of um, examples of thinking about, you know, how to preserve uh, this space for uh, resistance against oppression, because um, over the sort of 12 or so years that I've been at Fordham, things have dramatically changed in several of those places that I just mentioned. Um, you know, per perhaps most dramatically, we all remember uh, just a few months ago, 
the fall of Kabul and the, the real changes uh, that we see happening in Afghanistan um, and the serious crisis facing people living there. Um, but so too in, in Hong Kong, in China, um, there's been a, a serious rise in authoritarianism uh, in the government in China. Um, and uh, the city of Hong Kong is sort of unrecognizable in 2021 for anyone who was familiar with its kind of vibrant uh, civil society space uh, just a few years ago. Um, and in Myanmar as well, there's been dramatic change just about, you know, uh, eight months ago, nine months ago, um, a coup that sort of undid the work of the past number of years uh, of opening and reforming the legal system there. Um, so, uh, maybe I can just talk a, a little bit about a couple of the projects that we have. In our work, we're really trying to identify um, human rights violations or atrocity crimes in each of those places and support efforts that are resisting those violations by advocates, lawyers, and civil society groups. So over the years, we've developed a network of trusted uh, partners, um, and we try to work with them to consider whether domestic courts or domestic political processes can help or hinder the process of protecting resistance, right? Enabling um, people to stand up against um, rollbacks and pushbacks on human rights. Uh, but in particular, sort of our role uh, as an international legal organization is to figure out whether international law can provide relief where domestic pro processes cannot because the government is authoritarian or because um, the country has become increasingly closed or due to conflict, um, a humanitarian crisis or some other kind of transition. So in these partnerships that we establish, we identify ways our program can uh, help to elevate the work that those partners are doing. Um, and so a couple of examples of that are working together to hold training sessions on how to use international legal tools uh, and international mechanisms, right? A lot of law is, a lot of international law is uh, uh, sort of administered uh, for lack of a better term through international organizations like the United Nations with the hope that the UN um, and uh, related bodies will help to push countries to better uh, protect international human rights. Um, and so we've done that on a number of occasions with women's rights groups in Myanmar um, you know, we, we have not done that, obviously, since the start of COVID and um, the landscape for returning to Myanmar for an active human rights project um, is not looking so positive at the moment. Um, we also work with partners to create legal toolkits for advocates, uh, as well as ordinary people to um, understand how to access legal aid or other legal resources when they are detained for protests. So we've been doing this most recently in Hong Kong, um, a city that until 2020 was relatively open and free and welcoming to the idea of protest and resistance. Uh, but in 2020, the Chinese government passed a national security law for Hong Kong that effectively uh, rendered speech that was um, uh, unpopular with the government, uh, uh, illegal, uh, you know, to put it rather br bluntly. So we've been working with advocates to create tools that are in plain English that um, individuals can access in order to better secure their rights when they try to um, resist and protest some of these changes. Um, we've also on a number of occasions partnered with organizations and in particular women's rights groups um, to create advocacy reports or submissions to some of these international uh, bodies. And at the moment, we're providing a sort of rapid response um, legal resource coordination for individuals in Afghanistan. And I think it's, you know, it'd be an interesting conversation to have about um, uh, uh, sort of resistance in the context of crisis, because there are real safety and security considerations that um, where it's hard to sort of grapple with, you know, how do you resist under, under those circumstances where your life and the life of your family is at risk? Um, uh, and I think there's also a conversation to be had around um, how to resist when you're within a crisis um, or once you're part of the diaspora and what is the role of of non-Afghans in a, in a situation like this. But 
at the moment, because it's still an unfolding crisis, what we're really trying to do is create, again, legal tools for individuals trying to seek a safe pathway out of Afghanistan um, and resettle elsewhere, whether that's in the United States or somewhere else. Um, and so in each of these cases, there's a number of important human rights concerns, many of them centering around gender, certainly in Afghanistan and Myanmar, um, uh, and women's rights and resistance, and above and everything, this sort of uh, idea of accountability. Um, and so my, you know, my, my thoughts there are that international law and law in general sort of establish a, establishes a strong set of rules uh, relating to rights, right? We have a plethora of documents that define fundamental human rights, specific treaties speaking directly to women's rights. These include the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, its sort of twin, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, protecting everything from the right to vote to the right to housing, um, and then also a, a convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, um, in addition to many other uh, conventions and treaties. And so where there are rules, I think we generally hope that there's some measure of compliance, right? Compliance to the rule. We want accountability to be direct, enforceable um, as a consequence of wrongdoing. You break the rule, you face some kind of consequence. But um, unfortunately, um, international law disappoints us, right? And this is often how I begin any lecture relating to international law, because there are not direct, clear-cut, or truly enforceable mechanisms that can really force a country to change how they're behaving, despite the promises that they've made. And those are really direct, very clear promises. Ensure equality between men and women, eliminate violence against women, prosecute sexual and gender-based violence. Um, many of the countries that we work in have uh, 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 ratified or signed on to these international uh, treaty regimes, right? Many of them have explicitly stated, yes, we will do the following. Um, and, and no country is, is, is perfectly in compliance, but many countries are sort of very actively flouting um, these international rules. Um, and this is even more uh, uh, challenging when you're talking about authoritarian regimes and powerful regimes that have influence over international organizations like the United Nations. So within that context, we really try to focus on projects where we can you know, primarily enhance the international legal and advocacy skills of our partners, um, elevate their voices to the international stage. Um, and allow them to sort of highlight those gaps between promises that are made on the one hand, the law, um, and reality on the ground, because they're truly the experts that can highlight a lot of those discrepancies. Um, and I see our role too is helping to document and preserve information about abuse. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think in 2021 and in the years to come, we are not uh, facing a sort of global um, uh, landscape of countries that are trying to comply with international principles, international human rights principles. Um, but it's important regardless that we document and preserve information about abuse so that these, uh, that information can potentially someday be used to um, provide some relief to those people whose rights were abused. So we try to focus on, on those projects as well. Um, and then also, again, elevating local and community-based concerns and mes messaging to the international stage through advocacy. So some of those um, reports and submissions that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I, 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 I suppose I, I would close just by saying that building a framework for accountability is incredibly slow work and the successes are not always very obvious. Uh, I think I do, although it, this has been a very challenging number of years, I think anyone in any dif discipline can probably say that. Um, but I do take uh, some measure of hope in seeing um, the networks of uh, civil society organizations inside and outside Myanmar and Afghanistan and Hong Kong, just as three very different examples of places that have uh, uh, truly faced a lot of challenges over the last year alone um, and seeing that resistance, that ongoing resistance um, and uh, uh, shoring up some measure of hope because their voices continue to 
uh, be heard. And so I think that it is the responsibility of people outside each of these places to help elevate those voices and um, preserve that message as we as we move forward. Thank you so very much. Uh, and now uh, for our final presentation, uh, we will have Professor Kuda Kali. Um, hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, and of course, uh, what a, a tremendous honor uh, and, and pleasure it is to, to listen to uh, Elizabeth or Professor Wickery, uh, as well as Dr. Um, Tamara on their relationship with resistance and particularly resistance from um, the feminist lens, uh, which is such a crucial conversation to have. Um, my context and, and part of the conversation that I wanna bring today is coming from a very specific um, experience as being a community and movement uh, lawyer um, for uh, sex workers collectives and sex workers organizations. Um, I want to make sure that I'm prefacing this, that I'm located in a space physically um, as well as socioeconomically of privilege, and I myself uh, am not a sex worker. Um, and so much of my commentary is, uh, like Liz spoke about, is coming from uh, being a lawyer and representing the rights of sex workers um, in, in various forums, including uh, court courts, but not uh, only courts. Um, and so part of what I want to present today is really bringing a, a broad uh, spotlight or wide uh, spotlight on sex work, the idea of sex work as work um, within a labor rights framework, but also talking about a second movement or paradigm that stems out of what is now become almost a resounding uh, and collective demand for decriminalization of uh, sex work and more specifically sex workers uh, across the world. Um, to be clear, when I talk about sex work in my presentation, I'm talking about the plethora of services that are implicit and explicit, explicitly sexual in nature, but these also include intimacy services um, that are often performed uh, for something um, that is remunerate or quid pro quo, and often this is money, but doesn't necessarily always have to be money. Um, my work and advocacy focused around representing street-based sex workers, um, which are often, uh, particularly in the global south, the most visible representatives of um, this community of workers and individuals who engage with these services. Um, and therefore, I think because of their visibility, most targeted by uh, state agents and society at large. Um, my work uh, is based out of India, but most specifically South India. But I think pieces or components of my presentation to speak to the experience uh, of this community um, uh, at large. Um, a part of uh, representing sex workers collectives or sex workers in court has meant to negotiate actively with agency, my own gender, um, and my uh, location as a representative of sex workers, um, and also to negotiate with physical space and the law in the way that doesn't often happen when you talk about either a worker identity or you talk about um, a, a visibility that is hyper-focused on uh, one's sexuality. Um, and so there's a high feminization of the imagination of sex work. And, and when I say feminization, I also include the queer femme experience um, that comes with uh, how we think of uh, sex workers. And you know, if you think about pop culture representations, um, you often imagine um, a woman or somebody who is trying to pass for femme female. Um, associated with sex work, but certainly the conversation is not centered. It, it, it encompasses, and I would say joyfully so, um, all expressions of gender and orientation. Um, so what what are the problems that I want to look at? Uh, one, and, and perhaps primarily so, the criminalization of sex workers and sex work, right? That um, in, by virtue of criminalizing uh, sex work, um, sex workers are subjected to the denial of uh, their basic uh, and fundamental human rights. This denial is activated by pervasive violence 
stigma, discrimination, both by society and the state, um, which undermines their dignity and erases uh, their humanity. Um, in terms of being conflated with trafficking or anti-trafficking laws, um, the systemic oppression and criminalization of sex workers um, exacerbates um, their exploitation and in many ways fundamentally undermines um, the project of anti-trafficking um, because uh, you land up either looking at sex workers as the criminal themselves or looking at their circumstance and situation through agency and autonomy as being criminal. Um, and so because of this, uh, the advocacy and recognition for sex workers' rights um, is diverse and much like any other movement, um, not a monolith, which means that there is no one direction this community takes. And even when I present to you these two paradigms, um, they're not the only paradigms that exist within uh, the space uh, for this conversation, which is um, personal, political, and ideological. Um, the human rights framework, which I want to bring in, and it's important, and I think Liz spoke to it a little bit, is the constellation of conventions, declarations, observations, and recommendations that seek universal adoption, or at, at the very least, a collective recognition or acknowledgement, primarily from nation states. So when I use the word state in my presentation, I'm talking about countries, and I'm talking about um, the government. Uh, and so the promise of this framework is that these rights are inherent, they're inalienable, um, and they hold countries or governments duty bound not to infringe them or uh, in fact to promote and protect them. And so the inalienable or universal promise of human rights is that every person by virtue of being human um, is owed these rights. And um, what is true of the experience of sex workers is that um, this is absolutely not the case. Um, and what is critical and urgent about this conversation is that we're not just looking at society stigmatizing and uh, marginalizing individuals or sex workers, we're looking at governments and states actively using agents like law enforcement, um, and, and other sub agents of uh, reprimand to curb aggressively um, sex work um, and to do it in a way that uh, creates um, uh, truthfully fatal experiences for sex workers when they are confronted with the state. Um, so women who participate or women, and when I say women, I include all realizations of feminine femaleness who participate in, the sec in sex work may not necessarily locate themselves solely um, with that activity. So it's not a singular identity. And this is really important for me to say because part of the two paradigms that I wanna talk about is the first, and both of them I've realized uh, through my work uh, representing sex workers is that um, the, the common demand is decriminalization, but once, um, let's say in a hypothetical world, uh, collectives at attain that, there's a lot of deviations that can go behind what's the next step after decriminalization. And so the two that I want to explore is one is uh, decriminalization or moving from criminalization to a fuller citizenship or the full realization of citizenship rights. And the second paradigm I wanna talk about is going from decriminalization to a labor rights recognition paradigm, right? And the slight differences between the two or the major differences, some may argue between the two. So going from decriminalization to fuller or full citizenship is um, the demand that um, within the various intersections of high risk um, informal employment, one being sex work, um, individuals or women who participate in this are questioned by their in, in fundamental ways and in daily in, in experiences that are part of daily life um, that uh, closes the doors around choice, agency, privacy, but even um, puts them in a second class citizen category, which means that discrimination is all encompassing in every aspect of their existence, whether it has to do with sex or sex work or not. So we're talking about access to health, housing and education, or even access to justice in a way that is 
um, not equitable to any other citizen within a, a space. So I can't access housing or I can't have my children go into a school or I can't go and meet a, a health or medical practitioner in the same way another citizen can within the territory because I happen to be either doing sex work or suspected of doing sex work, right? And that this paradigm is about um, an advocating of fuller citizenship rights because of the double or sometimes triple marginalization of uh, performing sex work, but also probably being located in the intersection of another marginalized identity. So being a sex worker and being a person of color, suppose, or being sex a sex worker and being queer or being sex worker and being of a lowered caste context, which is true um, in, in South Asia. And so that's one paradigm going from decriminalization to an understanding of fuller citizenship not necessarily that the state should focus on my worker identity as a sex worker but the state should focus on allowing the full enjoyment of me as a citizen and allowing me to participate fully within society and not um, stigmatizing me or even perpetrating violence against me because of this choice and and respecting in many ways um, uh, a, a, a comprehension of privacy. The second paradigm, which I think maybe more people will be familiar with in terms of a framework is going from decriminalization to labor rights recognition. So examining the location of sex work um, as guaranteeing a freedom to first be recognized as doing work, um, accessing livelihood, um, and, and um, participating in workers' rights in the form of being free to unionize, creating um, workers' protections or participating in workers' protections that include access to social security, um, uh, being covered by sexual harassment protection laws in the workplace, uh, negotiating physical spaces, particularly for street-based sex workers as um, spaces that are work sites, um, and therefore part of right to livelihood or, or even uh, um, uh, gainful employment. Um, and so the labor rights paradigm is useful um, when individuals or collectives can claim a space within negotiations about the welfare of a worker. And I think even more so, the conversation is shifting to say that um, sex work doesn't even have to preface work it's work and, and a sex worker doesn't always have to be located with their act. They're simply a worker within the larger understanding of labor and workers' rights. Um, often, uh, often this movement, not always, but often this movement um, is, is um, leading towards a conversation around legalization of sex work. And that conversation is, you know, a whole other conversation. Talk, we're talking about what regulation looks like and what regulation when uh, the state, who has been a classic perpetrator of violence, now is transitioning into something else. And so uh, regulation negotiations around a lot of places in the world that are legalizing sex work um, uh, is often a demand from the sex workers perspective to focus on what sex workers need when they talk about legalization, which is a recognition of workers rights, but is also an extension um, into uh, opening up uh, the possibility of special protection laws, um, tax breaks, um, and, and also um, special business codes and occupational and health standards. Um, which are protected by both private as well as public agencies, um, and then also supporting work-related social and financial entitlements, um, which includes annual leave, vacation, medical and parental benefits, um, accident compensation, um, et cetera. Um, and so within these two paradigms, um, there's uh, you know, a host of conversations that take place. Um, there's also, uh, you know, uh, much like with every movement, a candid fracturing and, and it's healthy and it is part of uh, the, the business of resisting is to explore all the dimensions of, um, uh, all the dimensions of um, the realization of rights and what that looks like um, within the intersections. And so these are just two that I wanted to bring up um, for my presentation. And sort of just in, in closing or in conclusion, um, I want to talk about the fact that criminalization of sex work is um, 
sits at the sits at the cornerstone of how we as a society that is primarily a carceral focused, primarily criminal penalization focused, very, puts very little resources into restorative, reformative, um, and transformative justice practices, incentivizes actively law enforcement to act with impunity. Um, and acting with impunity includes um, forms of violence that um, have left uh, sex workers communities scarred that have uh, led to um, multiple um, experiences of trauma um, and also dehumanizing and invisibilizing the fundamental humanity of individuals who um, practice sex work. And so the demand for decriminalization specifically, um, and I'll speak even uh, to, to the movement that is you know, here in New York City, um, is that to currently, when we talk about decriminalization, we're talking about um, the two forms of criminalization that exist is primarily the criminalization of the worker themselves or the Nordic model where uh, the worker is not criminalized, they're, they're identified as a victim, but everything surrounding them is criminalized. So um, anybody who lets out space for sex work uh, could be possibly penalized and incarcerated. Anybody who is buying sex work or, or um, uh, you know, interacting with a sex worker for the purposes of engaging in solicitation is criminalized. And very often, and this is true for the Indian context, uh, people who are living off the wages of sex workers are criminalized. So we're looking at children, partners, grandchildren, um, parents, and other family members um, who, are, who, who also um, are confronted with uh, the law. And because of these two versions of criminalization, um, it's created uh, this sort of a, a system that um, really strongholds the, the sex worker, uh, removes agency and autom autonomy, but also completely marginalizes um, them in either an experience of pure victimhood or an experience of pure criminalization and, and demonization by, by the state. Um, so part of the demand of decriminalization is to first and foremost repeal and dismantle all laws that criminalize the sex worker specifically, um, but also to vacate uh, warrants, dismiss cases, and erase convictions, um, as well as end detentions um, that are connected to uh, crimes that are attached to sex work. So this in includes ending detention for individuals who are um, have been uh, convicted of sex work or, or, or prostitution, as it is often called in the law, but also those individuals who have been dependent on that. Um, part of decriminalization efforts, more radically so, is also to talk about how rehabilitation is harmful. So locating the sex worker as a victim, removing, again, agency and autonomy, not really having a, a, a holistic conversation around rehabilitation, but housing them in a quasi-detentional facility and then forcing some sort of vocational training or some sort of desensitization um, uh, programming because you know the, the, the anxiety is societies that we must rid this person of um, their sexual deviant nature, right? And so all of this is problematic and all of this needs to be dismantled. So the decriminalization project um, uh, is uh, a culmination of all of this. Um, so part of the decriminalization process is also to remove peripheral, peripheral laws that um, inadvertently punish sex workers. So laws that punish loitering, laws that criminalize being poor or criminalize poverty, uh, the criminalization of choices um, around sexual orientation and gender identity. So more comprehensively, laws that simply limit the agency of female, femme, and queer persons, right? Um, and that may include uh, the agency around bodily agency, but also the agency of expression and, and um, choice when it comes to privacy and when it comes to work. Um, so pushing and, and, and taking a slightly centralist approach to the same argument is that I would say the, the, the failed and foolish moral anxiety that we as a society have around sex work is that the moral anxiety is that is is you know, is it, it is what it is. It confronts 
uh, religious and traditional understandings of uh, social institutions like the family and like marriage. And we feel, I think, as a society that um, this practice uh, stands in, in um, opposition or in, to the detriment of these social institutions. But the other anxiety, which I think more people are willing to get on board with, is like the, the notion of how sex work is conflated with trafficking and how it increases uh, the exploitation of women and children by its by virtue of its existence. And I'm not going to get into this the presentation of why that's not true, because that would take another hour. <laughs> but I'm happy to have that conversation in person. But I will say this, by criminalizing sex work and sex workers, you are pushing exploitation and actual trafficking deeper underground. You're limiting um, spaces and you're limiting access to justice choices for those individuals who truly are victim survivors of trafficking because you're criminalizing them or you're criminalizing everything that surrounds them and the violence that is often perpetuated against them are the same authorities that they have to go to to complain about their status, right? And it's the same law enforcement, it's the same police authorities that are profiling and targeting and, and committing acts of violence that you have to go to to file a complaint if you are a victim survivor of trafficking. And that's a problem. Um, and, and so what I would say is that the, the, the engaging in both the legal imagination and the public necessity of sex work um, is engaging in, in fundamentally what it means to be an egalitarian society of choice and autonomy and how we uh, do that both in terms of respecting and restricting um, uh, ourselves so that people uh, can enjoy freedoms and people can um, enjoy uh, a choice in terms of their livelihood, but it is also talking about what it means about protection and the promotion of rights for those who have been historically marginalized because of their choice of life and livelihood, because of their um, socioeconomic context, and because of their um, gender and sexual uh, expression. Um, and uh, there's something to be said to me, at least, that um, it is not compelling to say that a nation state is, uh, is abiding by their human rights obligations or are human rights centered if they are criminalizing um, their sex workers and they are allowing state agents to act against sex workers um, with impunity. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, just a reminder once again to the audience, please do submit questions to me uh, via the private chat function. Um, and we will continue. I will start with a, a few questions and then um, do bring them in. Uh, and I'll try to bring in questions from the audience uh, as we go. Uh, so, so first of all, one of the things I really appreciate about uh, you know bringing together people from different backgrounds, different um, uh, disciplines, theoretical uh, uh, homes, um, is that it you know gives us a really interesting chance to see how um, these different disciplinary um, dimensions can inform each other and inform the conversation overall. And so uh, I was curious, I know that uh, Liz and, and Ramya, your focus is on changing institutions and you know, engaging in uh, public advocacy with, um, with governments, with state actors or international actors. Um, but I was curious if uh, given your interactions with these different groups that you interact with, um, if there's anything um, from uh, Tamara's presentation that sort of rang true to you, um, uh, examples of quiet resistance that sort of come up um, or have come up with the, the various groups that you've been engaging with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think especially um, uh, the, when you work in as I have uh, for a number of years, um, what I call sort of closed spaces or authoritarian spaces. I mean, I don't really have a, a, a great term um, because they, they are not all the same, but there's often quiet resistance because that's the only permissible form of resistance, right? So um, uh, it, I'll take China as an example. Um, we work with and we have for um, 
at here at the Leitner Center for over a decade. And, and um, prior to my work here at Fordham, I worked at an organization that um, focused on, on China, human rights in China. That was actually the title of the organization. Um, but uh, things there have, you know, I alluded to this when I spoke earlier, but things there have become um, much more difficult for uh, people who are resisting um, the government's sort of limits on expression, for example, or limits on protest. Uh, so it's not the case that um, protest was never permissible in any form or that certain types of advocacy were not permissible, but it has become more and more challenging and that has kind of um, uh, been together with the rise of Xi Jinping to power. And um, right at the beginning of that time, when it was becoming clear that uh, less and less speech was going to sort of be green-lined and more and more speech and forms of protests were going to be red-lined, um, people started developing more types of quiet or concealed resistance, right? So um, as an example, um, when, uh, active, when you would meet with activists who wanted to discuss their work, um, if we were in public, one sort of quiet form of resistance was to drink jasmine tea because um, at the time there were a sort of set of resistance movements in other countries called the Jasmine Revolution. And so, um, you know, people started drinking jasmine tea as a kind of quiet acknowledgement that this was something they were trying to push towards. Um, there was also, you know, in uh, uh, texting and um, expression online is very limited in China because they have a very sophisticated form of censorship. And so there are very creative ways um, that advocates and often artists who are involved in resistance movement um, pick up to um, use, uh, um, you know, words that are, that sound very similar to resistance related words and depicting those pictorially as a way of indicating your perspective on certain issues. So these are just a couple of things that came to mind as, as uh, Tamara was speaking, because I did think, um, although usually what we're dealing with is trying to um, increase the volume of some of this resistance, at least because it's safe for us to do so outside of, um, outside of China in this case, for our partners there, they're often looking for those quieter ways of, um, those quieter and, and sort of those, um, those ways of expressing resistance that can be denied later, right? Uh, so I thought that was, uh, that, that resonated with me. Um, thank you so much for this question. And I mean, there's so many ways in which I can answer this. Um, talking about culture, theater, and song, but I really want to talk about two examples. One, uh, you know, specific to the pandemic, um, India was, and much of the world, but India was ravaged by, by COVID, and particularly in the second wave with the Delta variant, um, we saw uh, fatalities like never before. And also we saw that working class communities and informal sector communities um, were pushed to the margins in terms of um, your basic needs. And one of the things that uh, sex workers movements uh, and unions started doing is um, crowdfunding resources and crowdfunding um, food items and, and redistributing in their community. And it didn't come from any sort of space of we are coming as a sex workers collective or we are I'm coming as a sex worker. It was coming from the location of um, the community is going through something and we are part of this community um, and a responsibility that we have um, both either from a philanthropic spirit or from a redistribution of resources at a time of crisis uh, spirit and both of them you know ideologically sound is that we need to participate in in resource gathering and redistribution and this is a workers community that has been affected by the pandemic um, in a very acute way because uh, nothing hinders intimate services like social distancing um, and um, if you do not have access to internet and if you don't have access to technology you, and you don't know what OnlyFans is, it's not going to work um, in terms of access to livelihood. But the responsibility of the community of making sure that 
uh, crowdfunding and, and, and gathering resources so that the rest of the neighborhood, other workers' communities were um, okay, had basic needs, um, was something profound. Um, and I think the second uh, thing that I want to talk about is that for, um, for communities that are habitually persecuted, particularly with acts of violence, um, quiet resistance is existing sometimes, just moving about uh, your world and, and taking up space and, and um, intervening and disrupting spatial places where you should not be or you, you cannot be and, and, and existing. And I've seen with sex workers at least, uh, there is something um, uh, fundamentally tragic and romantic about the way that um, they claim space um, when space is so often um, not given to them. Um, and so, you know, part of Tamara's presentation was so compelling to me because um, I think um, quiet resistance is the, the foundation to all resistance. So I, I actually, this is a good segue. So I was, I was curious uh, tomorrow now, um, how do you see the relationship between quiet resistance and other forms of, of resistance? Uh, do you see this as something completely independent or something that is uh, valuably pursued alongside other forms of resistance? Or perhaps, as, as Ramya said, it can be foundational to, to other forms of resistance. Uh, so I, I'm curious uh, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, great. Um, these examples are so wonderful. And I um, it was so great to hear, Ramya and Elizabeth, that you um, have seen quiet resistance on the ground in your own work, because uh, part of my motivation for writing about quiet resistance was that I found that a lot of uh, like philosophical theories of resistance would just leave it out or act like it wasn't real resistance because in order to be resisting you have to intend to you know change the public sphere um, and so I was really inspired by the cases that you're bringing about and I'm glad to have that confirmed that um, yes it's a real thing <laughs> um, so, so I wanted to um, so in response to your question, Steve, I think that some, I mean, I think sometimes quiet resistance can lead to, lead someone to political activism. Um, it can be foundational for an individual if they start with quiet resistance, um, it can then lead them to, to want to um, take a stand um, or to protest. So for example, actually the female bikers of Cairo started out as a, a small group of friends who just wanted to get together on the weekends. And now the more that they're getting interviewed, they're starting to talk about resistance in more political terms and starting to really care about fighting um, you know, for women's rights. So I think that in you know, becoming recognized as resistors, they started to think of themselves as like, oh, wow, like we can actually do something here. Um, and and um, so, but I don't think that's necessary. I also think there are plenty of cases where quiet resistance is just something that you do to get by and to survive your world under oppression and it might not lead to political activism and no one might ever recognize it and um that's okay because it's still valuable um <laughs> in, in the ways that i've been talking about um uh yeah so so that, that would be my answer uh as sort of a, a follow-up here a connected question from the audience um so i'm going to read it uh, I'm wondering whether movement resistance is possible without a foundation in quiet resistance, since any form of change needs to engage people uh, personally and emotionally and not just as a moral abstraction. Uh, second wave feminism used the personal private is political um, as illuminating how women's everyday experiences are impacted by oppressive social and political structures. Mm. So is the question, can you have political movements uh, if there aren't, if people haven't been already like quietly resisting in their day-to-day -day lives? Yeah, that, that's sort of how yeah. I'm understanding that, that question. Yeah, I suppose it would be very difficult and like, where would the movement come from? Like, I feel like, you know, active, like political movements come from people's experiences with oppression and, um, you know, coming together and talking about it and forming solidarity groups and then organizing collectively and deciding that we're gonna take a stand together because of these shared experiences. 
So I think it'd be very difficult. I mean, I don't know, like, it'd be very likely to have a movement with no quiet resistance. Um, but so the point that I like to make with quiet resistance is that it's not the reason that you're quietly resisting is not that you um, are trying to change the law um, or that you are trying to make a public political statement. You're doing it simply because this is what you love or this is what you care about doing. Um, so there may be positive political consequences to quiet resistance. So for example, if more and more women in Egypt start to ride motorcycles, it might start to actually change the norm. It might no longer be a taboo thing for women to do. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're quietly resisting, that's not the reason why, that's not the primary reason why you're doing it. You're doing it simply because you love it. Um, so yeah, I, so I think that it would be very, I feel like because movements arise from personal experiences and people collectively bonding and sharing stories and narratives with one another, I think that it would be very difficult to have a movement without quiet resistance. But I also think that the reason for quiet resistance isn't to have that political impact, that that would be sort of a decision to move on to a different kind of resistance. Great, thank you. Uh, so now I have another uh, question from the audience, uh, moving uh, to the questions about uh, international law. Um, and so this was uh, originally directed uh, toward Elizabeth, but uh, Ramya, you could also uh, speak to this if, if you uh, would like. Um, so what would be reasons that cause countries to disregard conventions uh, that they ratified? Uh, would universal ratification actually improve compliance with these conventions? I, I see Ramya smiling and I, I think it, Ramya used to be a colleague here at the Leitner Center and we probably spent most of our days um, discussing this very question. Um, I mean, why? I think another way of getting to the answer is why would countries comply with international conventions? Because ultimately when a country signs or ratifies an international treaty, they are limiting their own power within their borders, right? So if you are um, if a state is ratifying a treaty that says all individuals have the right to vote, you are, um, uh, or rather you are required to ensure that all individuals have the right to vote, you're limiting your ability to pick and choose what you do with regard to your citizenry. And so, um, you know, if there is no sort of international police force or international court that can make you do it, when it's expedient to flaunt those rules, why, why not? And I think there are a lot of answers that include sort of, um, you know, entry into an international club, an international community um, uh, as, a, as a more of a theoretical club, right? The um, countries like to have good relationships with each other and benefit from that in a variety of ways. Um, uh, and, and then entry into more sort of practical oriented cl clubs like the WTO or the EU. Um, there are very practical reasons why countries comply. Um, but um, y y there are, yeah, and I think there are also um, reason, historic reasons to point to, right? Over time, although I think we can say it's very, very slow, um, countries do tend to begin to conform um, to the way other countries are acting. And so as more and more countries join these international treaties, you know, the hope is, and I think to a limited extent, the, the reality is that countries sort of slouch towards compliance um, uh, with, with significant outliers. Um, but why do they not conform? Um, well, <laughs> when, uh, uh, when there are strong reasons to resist, right? Now here, a state resisting um, an international norm because of um, either ideological or um, uh, other reasons to uh, resist the conformity to the international stage. Um, I think that happens in a lot of different ways, right? So China's reasons for non-compliance um, are going to look very different to Myanmar's reasons for non-compliance and the United States' reasons for non-compliance, for example. Um, uh, and, and I think there's also um, a strong argument to be made that a country like, or a state like China, and, and recall none of these states are monoliths at, at, at all. Um, but may not view their 
um, activities as non-compliance, right? So um, this probably get, would get us into a much deeper conversation about how do we define um, the right to vote or how do we define equality between men and women uh, and international lawyers that are focused on human rights like Ramya and myself would probably describe that very differently to um, a lawyer for the State Department of the United States to um, a lawyer working for the Ministry of Justice uh, or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China. Um, so th this isn't a very good answer except to say I think it's an ex excellent question because this, this issue around um, compliance is an important one. I did, I used that term, um, but I don't know that I love it, right? Because I think that um, compliance suggests a very specific conformed activity to a rule, whereas international law and sort of human rights law allows for difference, right? The United States is not the same as China. Um, France is not the same as um, India. And so there is allowance for different ways of localizing uh, these, these, fundamental, these fundamental norms. And I think that's why it's impossible for um, groups like ours, right, based in the United States to determine um, uh, uh, the right path for, uh, country, for countries like Myanmar, China, Hong Kong, and we must partner with local advocates um, to ensure that we're uh, benefiting from that localization and from, from that guidance. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that as somebody who's practiced with human rights language in a domestic context, the human rights framework is not a dream fulfilled by any uh, measure of our imagination. But what it does is that it creates the opportunity for language and the opportunity of, if in, in a community of practice performance. Um, when we brought up um, the aspirations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the aspirations of um, the Yogyakarta principles, which is a declaration on, on LGBTIQ plus rights, but not even a convention, um, we did this because it is part of the, the larger human rights project around um, an awareness and an understanding that um, this is a dynamic space. And it is a space that began certainly with a history of um, a, a global Euro, global North Eurocentric focus, but has shifted and has been vernacularized among global South um, contexts. And, and I say global North and global South, not to be a ge geographic, but to speak about the, the differing socioeconomic experiences and post-colonial experiences that even exist within um, countries themselves. So you can have a global South experience in a global North country um, like the United States per se. So it, it's not a dream fulfilled by any by any measure, but what it is is um, it's an opportunity for performance in a positive sense. It's an opportunity for um, language and, and the dynamic nature of language to be adopted by those communities who need it the most. Thank you. Uh, so next, I have a, a clarificatory question from the audience uh, for Ramya. Uh, so in particular about sex workers being forced into vocations as a punishment or as a means to save sex workers from sexual deviance. Uh, could you say a little bit uh, to, to clarify those that idea? Absolutely. Um, so what is common practice in a lot of countries that adopt the Nordic model? And I'll remind you, the Nordic model is that the sex worker themselves is not criminalized, but everything around them is criminalized. So if you could picture a hypothetical where um, an individual is a uh, law enforcement raids a sp certain space, which is a, seen as a brothel or a trafficking riot, um, and individuals who are identified as sex workers are booked into the system as victims of circumstance, and then the state state contemplates um, what do you do with them, right? What do you do to reintegrate, rehabilitate, and, and, and in some sense, um, save them from the circumstance um, that they have been part of? And in many contexts, but I can speak specifically in, in the Indian context, this looks like a quasi-detention or incarceral space where a lot of these women are um, taken into spaces where they participate or they're forced to participate in different types of vocations and different types of sensitization programs, which tells them in all sorts of ways that the work that they participated in is not 
morally correct, not legally right, illegal, um, is exploitative, is, is um, robbing them of agency autonomy, it is harming their bodies, and therefore they should participate in this vocation to earn their livelihood. Um, and a lot of that vocation um, is menial. Um, it, it, it's not responding to the socioeconomic needs and the flexibility that often sex workers need and often must have, um, which is why they engage in that. And one of the the fallouts or the, the, the consequence, ironically, of um, rehabilitation programs is that while a sex worker is in rehabilitation, she the, the state or the uh, civil society sometimes partner that's doing it is not uh, providing gainful employment. So she's pushed further into, or they are pushed further into marginalization. And, and, and it is not um, uncommon for them to come out of that experience and even more so dive into um, uh, sex work uh, in order to address the, uh, the you know, the, the failing um, of loss of time and loss of resources and loss of being able to provide for their families during the time that they were put into those programs. Um, so it's counterintuitive from that perspective, but from the human rights perspective, it robs an individual of agency and choice. You are placing someone in a program that you presume is rehabilitating them. You presume presume is is reintegrating them to be a morally and socially good person in society. Um, and then you mix and match that with some activities that you believe may generate income. And in Indian, in, in the Indian context, this includes candle making and, um, and, and knitting and crochet, and then you release them back into society, presuming that you've saved and, and um, corrected the, the wrong that is um, their livelihood. And, and so there's a lot of problems with it. And, and we can get into conversations about uh, how it can be, uh, like I said, quasi-detentional, which is that at least in, 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 in carceral spaces, you have the right to be presented before a judge, before a legal system. In, in rehabilitation programs, you're not presented before anyone. And until somebody deems you fit to return into society, you sit indefinitely in these programs, which is not uncommon. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a question that is about like the the role of people who are external to the the issues, the conflict, etc., intervening or engaging with those issues. So, for example, um, if we have like Fordham law students, you know, um, doing this sort of clinical work, um, or Ramya, you you had mentioned in your presentation that you're coming from this position of privilege, right? Um, and so I'm sort of uh, asking what should what should be the values that guide um, people who are working through for, with these issues from the outside um, in terms of how they engage with the issues and with the people who are directly affected by them? Yeah, I um, this is something that we discuss every year with our students uh, in uh, and and repeatedly, right? So I think. Uh, first of all, um, absolutely acknowledging our privilege, um, our institutional privilege, our language privilege, our privilege being based um, in New York, um, in the United States, in the global north. Um, many of our students are white students. Um, we're often uh, working with people who are not white. And so there are all sorts of things to consider when entering into a partnership. Um, and one sort of guiding principle that we return to again and again is to truly be guided by the leadership of our partners on the ground. So not making decisions about what our um, focus is going to be, what the um, purpose of our project is going to be, um, what the result of our project is going to be ourselves, because we're not in a position to make that determination, but rather be guided by our local local partners. And that isn't just, um, it's not just theoretical, right? So we have a lot of meetings, um, you know, we used to have those meetings in person, um, either there or here. Um, now we have a lot of these meetings over Zoom or over, over chat um, directly with the people we're working with and asking them pointedly, you know, what is it that we can um, work on that will elevate the work that you are doing. Um, and there are a variety of reasons why, um, why we are in a position to do that. So it isn't that 
um, many of these individuals and groups can't engage in the type of work that we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but sometimes they're engaged in other issues, uh, sometimes they're non-lawyers, and we can bring that legal analysis, legal expertise uh, to bear. Um, sometimes it is a safety and security consideration. So a number of years ago, for example, we worked with a uh, network of uh, sex worker and drug user organizations in China who would have been... Um, uh, uh, they, they would have faced serious uh, ramifications if they had directly engaged in the international mechanism that we were um, submitting to the universal periodic review. So we did that under our name, um, but gathered inf the information and the recommendations that they wanted to make um, directly from them. So I think that a real emphasis on partnership and um, uh, seeing ourselves as true partners, um, you know, we're not typically, uh, the work does not typically result in an academic publication, so we're not driven by that sort of academic desire to um, publish and build the reputation of the individual authors, we're really focused on um, the clinical product of the work, which means that we can, um, I think, very meaningfully engage with the partner and um, sort of focus the pedagogy there, as opposed to focusing the pedagogy as a means of taking from the experience and building the um, skills of our students. Yeah, I mean, and I echo everything Liz said, and 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 the question that you asked, Stephen, is how to be an ally, and um, you know that is a, a journey and certainly not a destination. It includes, I think, um, part of the participation of allyship is to. Um, continue to commit and recommit um, and to uh, participate in call to actions. And I think now more fundamentally, given everything that has happened, particularly after um, uh, the racial justice reckoning of last year is to remove the burden from affected communities. And, and I say this explicitly when it comes to resources and, and um, access to recreational time in a way that affected communities don't have. And removing the burden off of effective communities, um, there's a, different ways to do it. And affected communities have articulated multiple times with real uh, practical examples on how that should be done. Um, and uh, that is the work of an ally. Um, and that is just a supplement to everything that Liz said. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so we are already at time that went by very, very quickly. Uh, and I do want to be respectful of, of your, your time, but I also wanted to give you all an opportunity um, if there is like one last takeaway that you would like to give the, the audience or if there's anything else that you would uh, like to briefly say, um, I would you know invite you or welcome you to, to do so. Keep resisting quietly or loudly. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent, excellent takeaway. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you all. That was a really, really a great engaging conversation. And um, thank you to the audience for all of the questions. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So big round of applause to everyone. <laughs>